Namaskar, uh, good evening, Sabaila uh, Swagata, welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, this is Hari Sharma with Social Science Baha. It's my pleasure to welcome you all. It's a very special lecture today. For, uh, this is 100th lecture. And we have the pleasure of uh, having this speaker, who is also a, still a member, executive member and a founding member of uh, Social Science Baha. So the last meeting, um, when we had our executive meeting, I think I was the one who proposed that on uh, 100th uh, Baha lecture, uh, the people should speak uh, in, in this. So uh, it's, it's 100th lecture and many more to come. So thank you very much for your patronage, support uh, to Social Science Baha's various lectures, programs. Uh, Baha is a place for convergence and conversation. It's a platform. Uh, we do many activities, but lecture is one of the major activities that we do. We invite scholars of uh, social sciences, uh, interdisciplinary sciences, to come and speak to Nepali audience, uh, not necessarily foreign scholars, Nepali scholars, and those who study Nepal, in and around Nepal, and question of social science. So it's a very, um, if you go to our website, you will see all 100 lectures listed there, including today's, it will be uploaded tomorrow, and then uh, there is a fantastic resources for the student of social science, uh, Nepali studies, culture, history, anthropology. So we're very proud of it, and uh, thank you very much for tonight. Uh, this evening's uh, uh, your, your, your gracious presence here, we even encourage Ash. So Deepak needs no introduction, uh, but it's a customary in such a lectures. Uh, one has to you know introduce the speaker. Uh, there are many who may not know him, but but looking at the room, I could see that uh, friends and colleagues who have worked with Deepak for many years. Uh, are uh, here also, so I want to acknowledge all of you. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> I, in, in the beginning, I asked Deepakji that you wear so many hats. How do I introduce you? <laughs> and Deepak said, uh, Pani Laure. And I said, no, 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 you are a Pani Pandit. Uh, so uh, Deepak has been working on issues of resources and energy for many years. Um, I had the pleasure of knowing him for the last 30 years. Um, I worked with him in various uh, organizations and platform. Uh, he is uh, currently a uh, Pragya, Pra Pragya, Academician of Nepal Academy of Sciences and Technology. Uh, he is initiating the colloquium on philosophy of science and science and technology. Uh, he is also the chair of interdisciplinary analyst, a private research firm, and he was also earlier uh, recently was also chair of the what, Nepal Water Conservations. Basically trained as an engineer, um, power engineer, uh, he has moved into different areas uh, of you know political economy, political philosophy, and most interestingly, when I met uh, Deepak early in the 90s. He was uh, uh, kind of full of many ideas, and one of them is cultural theory. Three-legged cultural theory, you know, this, this is what he has been, this is how one need to explain the society, you know, state is here, uh, society is here, you know, cities, and all kind of things. So it's just very interesting ideas, and he used, uh, and I was kind of surprised by his reading of anthropology, Mary Douglas, starting with the Mary Douglas and others. So, abundance with the ideas and uh, challenges, uh, Deepak has contributed a lot on the public policy debates also. So this is where his experience as a think, um, thinker, uh, academic, researcher, how do we look at uh, Nepal's development? So today's lecture, uh, Nepal's development predetermined through the lens of cultural theory. So, uh, the lecture will be 45 minutes and then we'll open for question and answer depending on your interest, the kind of interest that Deepak can kindle here. 
uh, it will go up to half an hour and then within one, one hour, 15 minutes, we'll be able to close it. It's a, Kathmandu has become suddenly cold today, this afternoon, you know, winds are blowing, so uh, time to go home after that. Um, so with these words, I uh, would again welcome you and thank you for your gracious presence here. Uh, Deepakji, you have the floor for 45 minutes. Thank you, Hariji. <coughs> Thank you, Arjee. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, first talk about my journey to cultural theory. These three books that you see there uh, span a period of something like from 1989 till 2019 March when the last one is coming out, Water, Food, Energy, Nexus out of Routledge. The one in the middle is what I'm going to base most of my talk on. Uh, it came out of Routledge in uh, 2017. Uh, what uh, uh, I'll talk to you about how I got into cultural theory first and then explain cultural theory in a very rapid way, uh, explain some of the international development pathologies as we call them uh, using cultural theory, uh, describe how shifts in development thinking uh, have been mapped by cultural theory's global perspectives. Uh, and then I'll get into some examples and ask where Nepal's development might be heading. Okay. So, the, uh, my journey to cultural theory actually started from engineering. And very quickly I came to realize that uh, engineering, after practicing you know, electrification of Dhanadura, outlying areas of Kathmandu and all, I quickly came to realize that engineering was mostly part of the problem, not the solution, <laughs> as engineers. Now that was quite a bit of a shock. And then I started getting into economics on my own, trying to find out how decisions are made and why. And uh, at that point, uh, Father Watson, my old teacher from Godavari School, I have Father Miller here, another one, uh, said, why don't you go to a university and study it rather than studying on your own? I said, who take me? He says, try, try this American University, you know, they take anybody. <laughs> yeah. So I applied for a Fulbright and got it and went to Berkeley. And uh, luckily at Berkeley, I was in one of the only interdisciplinary program designed interdisciplinarily. Uh, otherwise, people say interdisciplinary and put it under economics or engineering, and you know, it really doesn't become interdisciplinary. But this was designed, the Energy and Resources Group there, by John Holdren, who subsequently went to came, uh, Harvard and became Obama's chief science advisor for the last eight years. It was my professor. And what was interesting there is that allowed me to not do economics, but political economy. And then afterwards, uh, came back to Kathmandu, and while in Berkeley, a significant uh, thing happened. I was part of the Mohonk Conference in New York. Now, this is the famous conference in 1985 that actually debunked the theory of Himalayan degradation. Because the idea then was, oh, you know, the poor farmers in, uh, in Nepal are cutting all the trees and causing flood in Bangladesh. And uh, it showed that that's nonsense, that's rank nonsense. Uh, something else is going on. And uh, in that meeting, I came across some cultural theorists, notably Michael Thompson, Mike Warburton, who was a mountaineer, who lived in Berkeley, uh, and many others. In 1989-90, I was in the uh, University of uh, Southern California in San Diego, which is where Mary Douglas had organized her uh, conference. And that's how I came to know her in, you know, at the 1989 and have worked with her till about, till she passed away uh, in 2007. And that's how I came across cultural theory. And as I began to look at Nepal's development predicaments, international ones as well, this theory seemed to explain a lot of things much better than pure economics or pure political science or whatever. And uh, you know, as cultural theorists like to say, this theory reaches parts like that very good beer that reaches parts that other theories cannot. Okay. Now, in Nepal, after all that, I was, my last job was as a member of the Pokhran Commission, uh, looking at why 12 years of water supply project uh, failed, 1987 this was, and uh, uh, in 12 cities. And at that point, I began to you know, lose all faith in governments and the World Bank and all donors as well. And it's also uh, at this point that I began to uh, work more intensely with Douglas, off and on, and most uh, intensely when I was a visiting fellow at Oxford's Queen Elizabeth House. So this is my journey. 
Now, let me quickly explain counsel theory. Uh, what you see in this diagram, what counsel theory basically argues, that counsel theory comes from, it's a new Durkheimian theory, it's also called the theory of plural rationalities. Uh, the, you know, the Sufi mystics called Silsila, you know, the tradition of Guru Chela Parampara, as we call it. This is actually from Durkheim, Evans Pritchard, Mary Douglas, and down on. And uh, uh, in this, Mary had had only uh, two PhD students, both of whom I worked with, Michael Thompson and Steve Rear. Interestingly, Michael Thompson uh, did quite a bit of his research sitting here in the Nepal and climbing the mountains. Uh, his research was uh, seminal in trying to understand how rubbish scrap becomes antique. And in doing that, it demolished a lot of the foundations of economics. Uh, and in fact, Oxford Purdue published his thesis called Rubbish Theory, Rubbish Theory the book, and then immediately disowned it, which allowed Michael to reclaim his copyright. And he kept it and didn't do anything about it until recently Pluto Press has published it. I asked Mike's wife, I said, and why doesn't Mike publish it? And she said, well, he's trying to practice his theory, you know, that he's waiting until his books become antique. And indeed, in Amazon, the price had gone up, gone up to $1,100. Yeah. So finally, Pluto Press has published it with a new introduction and all that. It's worth reading. Why something that comes out of our market, economics says, you know, is there's a depreciation and value declines asymptotically to uh, something called scrap value, and then everybody forgets about it. But somewhere afterwards, suddenly that value shoots up as antique, and rat-infested slums become our glorious Victorian heritage. Uh, Stephen Graff's is what he studied also, these, you know, woven cherubic pictures, you know, that in industrial fairs in England, in the Industrial Revolution, for a shilling you could buy them. Now it's about 3,000, 5,000 pounds if you can get hold of one. Okay. Now, how does that happen? So the subtitle of that uh, book is called as the Rudiments of Cultural Theory, you can see there, is about creation and destruction of value. Okay. And Steve Rader's, interestingly, PhD was on the Maoists of Brixton in 1970s in England. Okay. And uh, interestingly, Steve was a member of the British Communist Party uh, until he joined the US National Lab, uh, but I think he had to give up all that, and now is a professor in Oxford. So culture theory really spans, and then Mary worked with Aaron Wildowski, who was a political science professor in Berkeley, which is why in America mostly cultural theory is seen as somewhat right-wing, because Aaron Wildowski was extremely right-wing, even though a professor in Berkeley. Okay. Whereas Steve was a member of the British Communist Party. So you can see that this theory spans just about everything. Okay? Uh, it, it transcends these kind of left-right kind of device that you normally uh, see. Now. Uh, what Mary did, and this is very significant, you know, what she did was, uh, as she was studying the Lele in Congo and all kinds of things, she began to say that there must be something about human nature and human behavior that must be common. You know, what is it that to some 200, 300 years of anthropological study have told us about human nature that can be generalizable? Now, this is mostly anathema to most anthropologists. And Mary has a withering comment on that. She calls it bongo bongoism in anthropology, which is, she says, and I was in the London School of Economics when she said that and squashed one of the anthropologists there who asked her questions she didn't like. And uh, interestingly, I won't give them the name, but this guy got his PhD from uh, studying the tunnels. Asked a question that Mary was devastating. She said, oh, I'm tired, she said. You know, every time you try to generalize and have an intelligent conversation, you get a tiresome anthropologist who shows up and says, oh, but in my village of Bongo Bongo, that's not how it is. Okay. So, you know, her, her attempt at generalizing common human behavior, and if you go to her first books, you know, the first one being uh, Purity and Danger in uh, 1966, and by 1970, when she had written Natural Symbols, She's already talking about seeing how behavior of purity and these uh, abominations of Leviticus and all that could be generalized to explain the behavior of people in London. So the second thing she did was that not just generalize, but apply that to studying modern society. 
Now, this is what began to interest me. If it was purely studying the other in some remote part of the world, as an engineer, I would not be interested. Because my problem was studying the problems of my society here and now today. So this was really fascinating. And as you can see, my, my Steve Rayner was studying Maoists in Brixton. How is it that Maoists, you know, in the middle of uh, England, uh, uh, start their enclaves and cults? Uh, we have, I'll tell you more about the others who've done similar studies, but interestingly, concept theorists have been using that kind of generalization to understand moral society. And that is what makes this absolutely fascinating. Now, if you look at this diagram, what they use is what they call two discriminators. X and Y axis. Mary was famous for giving bad names. She called them grid and group and something in sense. Uh, recently, Mike Thompson and others have been using these two grid and group as on the x axis, you know, whether your competition is fettered or unfettered, you know, from uh, the right it, it's fettered and left is unfettered. From top to bottom on the y axis is whether your transactions are symmetrical or asymmetrical. And the top is asymmetrical, you come down is asymmetrical. Just using these two discriminators, as they call it, generates four what are called social solidarities or as Mike Thompson likes to use it, styles of organizing. In fact, he goes in his book, uh, Organizing and Disorganizing, his radical proposition is there is no such thing as an organization. There are only styles of organizing and there are four of these styles. Actually, there's one in the center called Hermit. Uh, we will not get into that, although I use that to understand and study and write about corruption in Nepal. That's a separate issue, we'll come back, maybe come back to that later. But if you look at it carefully, you'll see the world where there is very strong grid ascription and group cohesion, uh, uh, that's the hierarchic world, the world of hierarchism, army, bureaucracy and all. And the diagonal opposite is where you have no grid ascription and no group cohesion, uh, and that is the world of individualism. The animal nomenclature that you see comes from another concept theorist, Jerry Marks from Cranston University, who did a lot of study on how waiters cheat and how longshoremen and dockyard workers steal. He had massive data, you know what anthropologists do, you know, interview people all over and thousands of hours of tape, didn't know what to do with it and didn't make much sense until he came across concept theory and it fit perfectly and he got these four styles. Now, the diagonal that you see, hierarchism and individualism, this is well known in the social sciences. You have markets and uh, bureaucracies, you know, uh, state and market, that's well known. What concept theory does is fills the gap in the other two, which is egalitarianism, where there is very strong group but absolutely no group ascription uh, uh, or pre-existing rules all the activist movements and so on. And the other end, when there's very strong uh, grid ascription, but no group support, which is the world of fatalism. And Jerry Mas used that to describe the world of the hawks, individualism, who hunts alone, the world of the wolves, uh, which hunt in back and can bring down much bigger prey, the world of the vultures, who have to be together to find a prey in a uh, desert, uh, 50 pair of eyes is better than one pair of eyes to look at something like that. But once they get a prey, it's everyone for himself or herself. There is no commander in chief or colonel or somebody giving orders, okay? And then finally, the world of the donkeys. Uh, it's fatalized to world. Okay? So this gives rise to these, uh, uh, these types of uh, four organizing styles. And you see that uh, uh, it gives rise to behavior and, and beliefs as per your organizing styles. Now, for me as an environmentalist, what was really interesting, and this comes from the work of Buzz Hollings and Mike Thompson and others in at YASA, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, where I am currently also a visiting fellow, senior researcher. And uh, what you see here, now watch carefully, you see these four worlds, and you see the world of individualism where nature is benign, robust. It doesn't matter how much you fool with it, build your nuclear power plants, build your high dams, nature will take care of itself. This is what an average businessman will probably tell you. Make your money. That's all that matters. Na nature is robust to take care of itself. You go to the other diagonal, and this is the bureaucracy and hierarchy. Nature is robust but within limits, and we set those limits. We've got 200 PhDs working here. It's, they're all very wise and learned, so they will do the environmental impact guidelines they'll make out and all. You stay within them and you're okay. 
You can build your high dams and your nuclear power plants and follow all the EIS and you're okay. okay. You go beyond that, break the rules, and the world will come to an end. You see, that's it. Now, the world of egalitarianism is just the other way around where Himalaya is a fragile, nature is fragile, don't do anything, it's all taboo. Don't touch, don't build, don't you know, do this or that. Okay? But that's because they are organized as enclaves and they have to determine external threats to keep the group together, to keep group cohesiveness. So if you touch it, it goes, watch very carefully. You touch it and it'll go. It's like a marble perched on top of a football. Okay? And finally, the world of fatalism, where it's like a marble on top of a table. I don't know, it can go anywhere. Ke garne, that's the classic Nepali expression of fatalism. Okay? So that's what happens. Now, this asymmetrical and symmetrical transaction and competition fettered and accountable or unfettered and accountable gives also rise to four types of goods. Now, this is where all the environmental problems and social uh, campaigns against hydropower plants and all come up. Okay? You can see that for the private individualism, goods are private goods. You buy and sell in the market and that's it. That resource is abundant. All you need is freedom to innovate. Okay? Whereas for Arabism is public goods. It should be shared according to rules. You live in the minister's quarter down in Pulchok, you get a two-inch water supply pipe where water comes 24 hours a day. You live in our part and you get water once in three days for half an hour by a half inch pipe. These are rules. And you go by rules. Okay, this is public good. Okay. Now for egalitarianism, it's common pool good. It's everybody should have. You know, Bhagavati should be clean for everybody. Okay. So, and for the world of fatalism, it's club good. It's a club good because they are not members of the club, they've been excluded from it. So this is what gives rise, Carlson Theory says, that even something as simple as any electricity or bottled water or any water supply, you can, you can see that it's, water is no longer H2O. It's these four types of water. And Woe, be, woe unto anyone who is in the wrong one, you know. If you're trying to treat, you know, in, a, in a situation where people think that their water needs to be protected as a spiritual source, and you try to say that, okay, let's build a plant here and bottle it, you're going to get into trouble. This is what Skulls and Theory can easily predict. This, is, this comes out of this cartoon. We had Himal's own Bikas Rai drew this cartoon for us at one point, and I made a big plague out of it and presented it to Mary Douglas. Uh, this is from our study of groundwater overdraft in South uh, uh, Marchwar in uh, uh, the Taraya of Nepal, in Gujarat, Rajasthan, and Tamil Nadu, where we studied. There's a huge problem of groundwater overdraft. Okay? As you can see, individualism doesn't care. They can they have the money, they'll dig, dig deeper, put in more powerful pumps, because that allows them to grow alpha, alpha, and avocado, and all kinds of fancy things, and sell in the market and make a lot of money. And that really puts the water table down. The other side, you have the village headman who thinks that all this should be that the water table is going down, everybody's well is going down. So you have to have rules and regulations to regulate all this. Okay. Whereas the activist, angry young man, as you can see, thinks that the government is, you know, crooked and uh, you know the market is really rapacious and greedy, and therefore it's mostly about campaign and activism. Whereas the fatalist, well, migrate out to Bombay. What else can you do? You can't live there anymore. So you see this four this social responses to groundwater overdraft. Uh, fatalism is also consumer fatalism. You know, we generally accept any crap that the market sort of sells to us. You know, uh, unless there is some activity, activism against that. Now, one more item of culture theory is that these patterns repeat themselves, we argue, from the village commons to the global commons. You can go to a village and you'll find all four of them. You know, maybe one is suppressed and the other is hegemonic, but it's all there. Same as you go to climate change issues now, soon they'll be in meeting in Poland and you'll find all four of these, you know, there. The question is how are they interacting? Okay. What is the dynamics between them? Okay. Now, what this says is also, it's very important uh, because of theory, the level at which you are doing your science. So we argue, that, you know, you have two types of science. You have eagle eye science and toad's eye science. Unfortunately, much of climate change, much of what the donor agencies do is coming from this very high perch uh, eagle eye science, which has perspective but no depth. Whereas toad's eye science, we have great depth. You see what's going on down there.
but may not have perspective. A happy marriage of both is an ideal situation. This diagram comes from our study of groundwater when we're doing it, and this was taken on the Rajasthan Gujarat border. It looks like a truck. Unfortunately, it's not a truck. It's an irrigation pump. You know, because the Indian Rural Development Bank gives loans for two, uh, something like a two horsepower pump or something, and the farmers sell their wives' jewelry on them to buy a 10 horsepower pump by topping up. Now, the engineers and economists in the bank say the farmers are stupid. You know, two horsepower would do and why are they doing this? But well, the farmers are smarter than the engineers and economists. They know that a two horsepower pump will pump water for 2,000 hours out of the 8,000 hours a year and remain rusting in a go down for the rest of the months. Whereas a 10 horsepower pump can be fitted onto a chassis after irrigation season and used as a perfectly good transport device and pay their bank loans much faster. Now, this, you know, just it doesn't have a license plate. And when the picture was taken, it was driven by a 12-year-old 12, 12 boy who probably didn't have a license either. Okay. But this is the dynamism that's going on down there, which is visible only at a towards eye science level. If you're using a fancy NASA satellite that can read number plates of cars, you'll still, still, still think this is a truck. You will not know that this is an irrigation pump until you go down there and start talking to those guys. Okay. So this is extremely important for culture building. Now this also, uh, and uh, this is my last slide about culture building, this is also about, <coughs> this is also, remove the fake for a while. They don't strategize and organize. The other three do and they strategize upon those poor fake okay? Now, if you take these three, you quickly find out that each has a very def different definition of what the problem is. You know, pollution in the Bagmati, climate change, uh, electricity shortage. Each one of them has a very, very different definition of the problem. To hierarchism is scarcity, which needs to be managed by a wise guiding hand. Okay? To market is abundance, it's just that the rules are so crappy that they don't allow you to innovate. Okay, so get rid of all the regulations. Okay, and then you also have with the egalitarians, it's degradation. It's a very different thing. Okay, and you also find out strangely that the social sciences that each one normally gravitates to. Now within these social sciences, they're not tight compartmentalized. You find out that hierarchy tends towards law. Know, as the procedural thing to sort out problems. Market goes to neoliberal economics because it helps them be more efficient and uh, uh, do things like that. And uh, the egalitarians go for critical anthropology. These three very different social sciences. Okay? Now, you also see that there are three very different politics involved here. The hierarchic politics is the Nehruvian politics of commanding heights of the economy, controlled, government control, planned, and all that. The market individualism is Reagan or Thatcherite politics. And the egalitarian one is Gandhian politics. And of course, India gave up Gandhian politics even you know, long, long ago for a Nehruvian one. Okay. Uh, a colleague of mine from Berkeley, uh, Jim Williams, uh, who is a Chinese scholar, uh, he uh, studies Chinese, let's say, he identifies in China between 1948 and uh, uh, when, I, when he wrote his thesis on Fang Liji, the Chinese dissident, uh, uh, by about 1985-90, he identifies about eight or ten swings of major policy shift in China, you know, from a, a Gandhian Maoist style to a very Lu Sao Chi Nehruvian style, back and forth about eight times. You know? So this is very important how the dynamics uh, works. Okay? And what we argue now is that wicked problems cannot be solved by any one of them alone. It will be totally incomplete. The definition of the problem is very different from these others, the two others, from whichever one you start. And when the definition of the problem is different, your solutions are going to be even more different. And this is where the problem is. So we argue that Wicked problems like climate change, water, energy, food, you name it, okay? Wicked problems demand uncomfortable knowledge that can generate what we call clumsy or polyrational solutions, okay? So, and this means going for not one hegemonic solution, but many 10% solutions. So, if there's water scarcity in Kathmandu, maybe Melanchi is also one option, but right now it's been pushed as the only option. Whereas, 
bottled water, tankers, that's the market solution. Uh, you have uh, uh, solutions of uh, conservation, you know, getting flush toilets that won't use five liters, but only one liter and so on and so forth. So there are many solutions that need to be simultaneously addressed. Now, coming back to changing development thinking, we quickly find out that um, uh, aid as a phenomenon, now development has been equated with aid, which is quite wrong. Huh? Aid as a phenomenon of development only came after the Second World War. And it's very important to realize that Marshall Plan is touted as that eternal on which everything was based. But uh, Senegalese Marxist scholar recently when I was in Patna, the 200th anniversary of Marx, gave a wonderful talk where he showed that the Marshall Plan uh, was not exactly as altruistic as we are told it was. That uh, Europe shattered by war and then the Marshall Plan brought in aid, money and Europe recovered and all that. It seems there was a uh, not very um, uh, nice arm twisting that the condition for getting the Marshall Plan was decolonization. That would open up the rest of the market that was controlled by the British, the French and others to America. Which is what happened, and Pax Americana really started with the Marshall Plan. Okay, so this this is very important to realize the link between Marshall Plan and decolonization. The Bretton Woods institutions were founded then, and the main motive was preventing the Third World from being part of the Second World. Now, after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, what happened was the Elan Vital of this industry disappeared. It's going to be around for a while. Roman Empire took 400 years to decline. Uh, this might take not that long, but the Elan Vital seems to have gone. And I'll tell you afterwards when you come to Nepal that aid no longer really matters in this country. The money coming from remittances is so high that the government doesn't give a damn. It's, just, it's, a, it's a phenomenon that most aid people are not used to handling, you know, when they go to the foreign ministry or finance ministry. Now, few academic insights have also helped along the way. And one is that this narrow economic definition of poverty has given way, uh, given way to a more plural definition. It's no longer this one dollar per day kind of thing. You know. Now, as Stiglitz and Fitosi have come out, they've come out with eight dimensions, including things like quality of life, education, health, uh, you know, whether you have a good job, uh, whether you have political access, uh, you have a voice and so on. Okay? That poverty is defeated uh, only by creative combination of again these three legged stool, um, um, state market and uh, civic movements. Okay? Poverty is related to uh, or the absence of political power, hence the need for empowerment to do anything about poverty, okay? not just money. And aid agencies, are, and this is more important, aid agencies and their employees are often part of the problem and not the solution. Just as I realized that in 19, what is it, uh, 80s, early 80s, that engineering is part of the problem, it's high time that aid agencies people also realize that they are also sometimes part of the problem, not all the time. Okay. And finally, the role of technology. Now, this is a very, very unexplored thing. And I might add that, uh, you know, some technologies are empowering, whereas other technologies deplete resilience. And this is an extremely crucial thing that we really have to start thinking about. Now, cultural theory looks at many of these things. I've just done a summary here to show that yeah, you know, individualism, hierarchism, egalitarianism, and fatalism, these four organizing styles of cultural theory, look at all these kind of very critical things of development, and I've just taken about uh, yeah, eight of them, and come to a very different definition. Risk. To individualism, risk is an opportunity. Market people are known as risk takers, because they can make money by taking the risk. Of course, they lose everything also, some of them all, along the way, but that's the risk. <clears throat> Hierarchism, risk manager. They are trying to minimize risk by managing and giving rules and regulations saying don't do this, don't do that. If you go on a trek, you have to have insurance and you have to have, you know, all these rules, okay. And of course, which the solo climbers ignore all the time, they're individualists, okay. Egalitarianism, these are risk amplifiers. You know, they see a risk, they are known as canaries in the mind. They see a risk and, you know, they're criticized for being too alarmistic, but that's what they are. So even if they are 10% right, it would be wise to heed to some of what they are saying. 
And finally, fatalism is the risk absorber. They absorb the risk strategies of all the other three. Similarly, nature, I've already given you the example. Human nature, one says it's egocentric and intelligent, the other says it's sinful unless guided by a wise, you know, bureaucracy. Or it is altruistic but easily corrupted, say egalitarians, and it's unpredictable. Okay, governing, say the fate, fitness, okay? And you can go on with technology. The choice of technology also, I'll come to that later, is very, very different. They gravitate to different types of technology. Governance style, you know, guided democracy or unfettered uh, uh, governance or participatory democracy or benevolent dictatorship. So these are kind of the gravity, the naturally gravitating points. Justice, you know, equal opportunity, or equality of opportunity is what the individualists want, okay. Uh, equality of uh, outcome is what egalitarians want. You should not only start equal, you should also end equal, say the egalitarians. Whereas the market people say, no, no, you start equal and it's up to them with their capability and skills and all, and they end up very unequal, but that's all right, okay. Whereas, you have, uh, uh, whereas uh, uh, it's noblesse obligé for the hierarchs. You know, you've got to look after those who are less fortunate. So, and so, you see that each one of them, even the definition of the poor is different for each one of them. And foreign aid, you know, it's seen as distorting by the market people, it's seen as a public good by the hierarchs, it's seen as a fig leaf hiding exploitation and inequities by the egalitarians. And the poor, of course, the fatalists say, well, the rich get richer anyway, no matter what you do. So you can see that you see a very plural perspective on all these things. What's interesting in the study of climate change is also that this perspective shows that how inter international treaties come about and, and how they are successful or unsuccessful is also explained better by climate, by constituting. Now this one, this is how we think international treaties are made. You know, come, countries get together, <coughs> sit down, come to a consensus and, you know, there's a treaty, you know. Well, that's not true. Ozone Treaty showed that this is exactly what's happening. You are interweaving loyalties and solidarities. Environmental activists don't give a damn about what governments are saying in their own country. Their loyalty is to their other environmental friends across the border. Similarly, multilateral corporations. Of course, they follow the rules, but you know, rules are a constraint, you know, you just be smart enough not to get caught, okay? Scientific and professional groups, these are extremely important. You know, their loyalty overrides that of loyalty to the state, of uh, any given state and non-governmental organizations, of course. So this is the reality. Ozone Treaty succeeded because these interweaving solidarities, the concept theory solidarities that I described to you, market, state, and civic movements, came together and came to a consensus. And we have the Ozone Treaty very successful getting rid of, of the ozone depleting gases, okay? Kyoto Protocol so far has failed, and it failed dramatically in Copenhagen, and I think in Poland it's going to fail again. Uh, it's a big tamasha, but uh, because it has not been sufficiently plural. Kyoto Protocol, right up to now, is mired in what we call procedural fetishism. Even what is called the market solution, the clean development mechanism, is really not a market mechanism at all. It's, uh, it's bureaucraties dressed up as market. Try getting any fund for the clean development mechanism and you find out there's no market solution to it. You have to go through the bureaucratic hoops like never before. Okay? And so very little money has really been dispersed. Okay? So this is where concept theory comes in with uh, this thing. Now let me get some um, examples from Nepal. Uh, this is Marchwar. Now what's interesting with Marchwar, uh, South of Bandehi, and uh, you see the top uh, diagram, these are brushwood dams, that's in the Mali Alley in Palpa on the Tinau. Okay? And Marshwar is right on the tail end of the Tinau in Nepal. Now this brushwood dams, they're all over Nepal. One estimate puts it at something like maybe up to, well, when I did the study in the 80s, well, it was 80% of Nepal's irrigation. What government agencies managed was less than 20%. Okay? Even now, I think the figure is still somewhere close to that. Okay? Now, these brushwood dams are very environment friendly. They are very community intense. You know, communities have to get together voluntarily. In Karnali, Thalus get together in what are known as Osiris of 6,000 people for three shifts, that's 18,000 people, working for about two weeks to divert the entire Karnali in the dry season. 
comes the flood, the Karnali, that, that dam is washed off. Nobody needs water in the flood season, okay? So it's a very disposable dam. It's, it's ideal for an environment, yes, okay? Whereas what happens is they're under pressure because the community cannot really mobilize because of market pressure. Nobody wants to do voluntary job, you know, all the stuff. Right? So what happens is the managers come to the department of irrigation where there are engineers like me trained in all kinds of fancy universities. And we've only been trained in cement technology, you see, not in brushwood dams. No engineering institute I know teaches brushwood dams, okay? They teach cement, you know. Irrigation is about cement. It's not about farmers or water anyway, okay? Uh, so what happens is, this is in 1961 under Indian aid in Woodwall. Uh, the Tinao Hati Sude Baraj was built in 1961. And this is because the rich farmers in Marshua were getting into problem because Dr. K. I. Singh had started the revolt there uh, in 1951. The serfs were no longer as obedient. And so there was a problem. And because the landlords of Marshua had relations on Lucknow also, they managed to get this big project. It was built. The trouble is, you don't build this kind of cement structures on a delta fan. In Butwal, it's a delta fan. As the Tinao River comes, deposits all kinds of muck there, you know. It was built in 1961. In 1962, rivers built in Himalaya, what rivers in Himalaya do, the rivers moved west. And so this barrage was lying there for the last 30 or so years, high and dry, a monument to man's stupidity, okay. And it destroyed the irrigation system down below because in Moshua everything had been carved up. They had a very traditional system of water allocation from these brushwood dams. But they had been carved up into a north-south New York grid type canal system. Because the dam disappeared upstream, there was no water in the canals. The agriculture in that area collapsed. The people had to resort to any means what fatalists do. They became dacoits, ultimate environment individuals. Okay? And ultimately, Achyut Krishna Karel, if you read his memoirs now, is very popular and all. There was some police operation, but it was not so much the police operation alone that would have solved the problem. You see that household Kirloskar pump there, the one that was on the truck, okay? Now, every farmer, that area is swimming in groundwater, so people just bought a truck. If you couldn't, couldn't buy a pump, uh, 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 it would come in a bullock cart uh, for 50 rupees an hour. So you can see that, you know, the dynamics of technology choice from community-led uh, brushwood dam to agency-led cement dam to uh, individualism market-led pump. So you can see that technology choice also is very, very different. Community electricity, this is a new thing, it was uh, started in 2002-2003, okay? And uh, it's been going, there are now 300 groups, it was started with about 18 in 2003-2002. Another three, about 200, almost 300, and they're doing very well. Now, what are they doing? What they have managed to do is very creative demand side technology. Once electricity came through community electricity, it came through the Nepal Electricity Authority, it was just fatalized. You just got your meter in a house and that's it, okay? But here they have done chicken farming, they have done lift irrigation, which irrigation department has not been able to do successfully. Uh, they have done fodder because they can use electricity to you know, chop off fodder and uh, uh, full day work of somebody in the family is cut down to half an hour only. Okay? So all kinds of creative things have been done. Theft of electricity here is zero because of the structural measure that they buy electricity in bulk from the NEA and retail by themselves and the two have to match. As a result, this is the only place in Nepal. Bhaktapur has 60% theft, but you know, community electricity has zero theft. Okay? And, Women empowerment is occurring because men are mostly migrated out and community electricity folks, wherever there is community electricity, they, are, they have competitions for women electricians who have been trained and so on. And there are community electricity groups that are completely run by women. Go to see Diptara Thamswan's uh, community electricity in Chapa or Meena Khargaz in Sindhuli and you'll be struck with the amount of women empowerment that community electricity has brought about. Okay. So, you know, this is possible, but there's an open battle because the NEA is trying to squash it, the trade unions within the Nepal Electricity Authority. Melamchi, okay. as I said, this is very interesting because this is pro promoted as the one solution of all Kathmandu's deal. Nonsense, there is no one solution always, there are many solutions possible. And you can see that interestingly, unlike northern NGOs, southern NGOs, I've talked about this long ago, we don't agree. I was a founding observer of the International Rivers Network in Berkeley. It's a big organization all the world. They campaign for you know, bad, against bad dams. 
I said, I can't be your member because you have a slogan, no dams. I'm going back to Nepal. I don't want to live in the United States. And when I go back to Nepal, if I take up a slogan, no dams, I'll be marginalized politically in 10 seconds flat. I say, no bad dams. And that kind of shift allowed us to do the anti arun campaign. It allowed us to do the Tanakpur Mahabali sort of stuff and all that. Because we are for good dams and against bad dams. Okay. Now, what NGOs in Nepal, interestingly, the NGO forum was saying about Melanchi, unlike what most of us are used to hearing about NGOs, is the Nepal NGO forum was saying, build a bigger Melanchi, better Melanchi. Coming from NGOs. Now, what was it? What they were saying was, if you were to sacrifice a river, for heaven's sake, sacrifice it well. You go to this duffing guy and sacrifice a goat, and you know what, just come out with one leg and go home. You're going to take the whole goat and eat everything, entrails in included, okay? okay? So if you were to do that, and then you do it well. What they argued was, do it in a way, with a bigger tunnel, slightly bigger, it doesn't cost much more to, you know, increase it by 75 centimeters. You can get up to 50 megawatts of electricity in Sudha Rijal, and 200 megawatts of electricity till uh, uh, um, Karmaya on the East West Highway. Uh, Kathmandu Valley can get a uh, treatment plant from that electricity and Bhagavati will be clean. And with that clean water, Tarai can get 40,000 hectares of irrigation. So you see, there's a win-win. Kathmandu's water will be cheaper because electricity would pay for the cost of most of the tunneling. Uh, Bhagavati would be cleaner, Tarai would get irrigation, you know, and so on. And the country would get electricity. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Asian Development Bank and the Water Supply Department insisted that it be a single purpose water supply project only. Okay. So that's what we're stuck with now. So Kathmandu is going to get expensive water, Tarai is not going to get irrigation, or they're going to get dirty water from here, and there's going not, going, not going to be any treatment. Okay. Now, that's, that's the sort of the, uh, that's what Kalsa Theory immediately points to and say, wait a minute, you've got the thinking wrong. You haven't put in the other social solidarities whose voices should have been heard. Same with decarbonized transport. It's a big fight. And uh, you, go, you, you look at this and you see that ropeway as a technology had already come to Nepal in 1924 under Chandra Shamsher. USAID built another one in 1964. And they're all defunct right now. Some other ones, some other ones um, uh, are built now for tourism, but that's not the point. The point is goods carrying ropeway and ropeways that would rid girls having to go to school like that. They lose their fingers, you know that. It's, it's very dangerous here. Okay, besides falling in the water, I don't know how they fall, but I know that people have lost their fingers. Okay? Whereas a simple improvement that you can see down here, already invented and tried in Nepal, it's just not moving forward. And right now we're in Nepal going through what's called dozer atanka. Out of the 756 ward, uh, whatever it is, VDC, they don't call them VDC anymore, Gampalika and Nagarpalika, chair elected 300 are contractors with their own bulldozers. And all of them are intent on making sure that the road they are housing out goes past their house so that the land price goes up. Okay. I have seen one in Bellari in Tanguta, 17 alignments were being dug from the road to the Shiva temple, it's a 10 kilometer stretch. 17 alignments, 15 must have been washed out. You, you were there, you know, and we saw that. No, but this is the nonsense we're going through. Whereas a ropeway would have been much cheaper, three times cheaper to build, eight times quicker to install, and in terms of energy, it would be twice as energy efficient because it would carry twice the amount of goods per <coughs> of energy. Unfortunately, it's not going anywhere. Neither, if you read the chapter by Ashok Raj Pandey in the book uh, A Technology and Development, he is the first entrepreneur who started the electric vehicles here in Nepal, uh, a, a Harvard MBA who decided to come back to Nepal and not stay in the US. And it described the painful details of how it's not moving forward. The resistance of the bureaucracy, which only <laughs> wants to import diesel vehicles and petrol vehicles. If you go to this other report that has just come out, and I'm glad Doranji is here from United Nations to Nepal. Uh, from Nepal Climate Action Network, we brought out this report just, just before Dasan. Okay? And if you look at it, Nepal's climate policies are excellent. In fact, in Poland, we could easily claim that for our policies in Nepal on climate change, we should get the Nobel Prize if there is one. However, on climate action, we're moving in the exact opposite direction. In the last two years, my carbon footprint has doubled in electricity simply because we are importing more dirty coal-fired electricity from Modi's Jharkhand in Bihar than NEA produces. 
So we are all very happy that there is no load shedding, but the load shedding is at a cost mm. of dependence on India, massive, because more electricity we buy from India than we generate through Nepal Electricity Authority. And uh, economically we are bankrupting ourselves because we spend about 20 billion on electricity import per year. In addition to the 150 billion or so we spend in importing uh, diesel and petrol for our cars. You know? And just realize that Budi Gandaki could be built with just 25 billion rupees per year for five years. So with the money that we import for electricity and diesel for one year, we could build Budi Gandaki. It's not going forward. Mm -hmm. So this is where we are moving in an abysmal direction. Okay? So how do we explain this contradiction? And the reason, you know, absence of activism. There is so much donor money that has corrupted NGOs into becoming not activists but service delivery agents that you are not getting activism on this front. Nobody is even speaking out on this outrage. Okay? So this is what Council Theory would point to you. Now summarizing, I would say that uh, go back to this three-legged policy stool and what I find fascinating in this three-legged policy stool of bureaucratic hierarchism, market individualism, and activist egalitarianism is that there is tremendous parallel with the works of Karl Palani Who's, uh, who highlights these three different proclivities in his work, the classic work, uh, uh, Great Transformation. It also parallels what Stephen Lukes, who's been studying power of uh, coercive power, bureaucratic, uh, persuasive power market, and moral power, which is egalitarianism. And interestingly, it also parallels what Samkhya philosophy, Hinduism, has come out with, with these three types of power, tamasic, sattvic, and rajasic. Okay? And so there's a need to go back to this to try to understand the, 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 the dynamics of what is happening in our uh, society. We argue uh, that this is happening because there is a distortion of dharma. The bureaucratic hierarchism is not doing its dharma. It's become a license, rent-seeking license raj rather than a trustee of uh, Edmund Burke's trustees. Uh, market is also not uh, uh, real you know, competitive uh, market, it's crony capitalism, which now in Nepal is so so obvious, it's almost painful to speak about, okay? And <coughs> NGOs are also not activists, they're turning out to be bongos, 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 and bongos. <laughs> and the most dangerous to my mind are the bongos, party organized NGOs, you know? Or as I call it, make up an NGO. So you see this distortion, and as a result of this distortion, more and more people are being squeezed out into fatalism, is what culture theory is telling us. So in conclusion, this is my last slide. Uh, the conclusion of our book, A Technology and Development, is actually very mild compared to all that I have said. You know? Why? Because we are not advocating a revolution. As culture theorists, we don't. We believe that there must be some hierarchism, some market, some uh, egalitarianism. Uh, we don't believe that market is the only solution, as much of the industry has recently after the Washington Consensus of the 1990s gone into. Nor do we believe in the bureaucratic socialism that was there with Nehru's uh, socialism. It, you need a bit of all three. Okay? Uh, so the five, six conclusions we have is that we have to really be serious about reviewing and distinguishing good aid from bad aid, from green aid and ungreen aid is an obvious one to start with. We need to leapfrog to latest technology. And in this, I might as well say that uh, credit must be given in, uh, in Nepal for leapfrogging to Suresh Kumar Kudasini, who was the head of the Nepal Telecom. And there was a lot big World Bank A. And he was under pressure to go for the latest analog technology. And he resisted that and said, no, we will go digital. You know, this is in the 80s, OK? And because he took that firm decision and we got digital technology, oh, poor country like Nepal, why do you need digital technology? You know, you can get some of this second-hand stuff from Brazil or wherever it's much cheaper. That was the World Bank's kind of argument. He resisted. As a result, we had fax. Otherwise, fax would not come with analog technology. It came with digital. And that fax actually helped the 1990 democratic revolution. Okay? Uh, we, aid money is often not the solution. As I said before, remittance economy with 30% of the GDP coming there and the Nepal government revenue increasing like crazy in a country that really doesn't have a 50 government. 15% per annum to 23% per annum increase in government revenue. Why? Because of remittance and remittance is buying better education, better food, better health for children and everybody else. And all that is important. That un informal tax or uh, indirect tax that's going on is increasing government revenue like crazy. 
and uh, therefore, you know, the government officials really don't care about foreign aid anymore. So that's important to realize that money is not being used properly. We have to go into greater detail about all these development projects. The devil is in the details. You know, it's that Bill Clinton's, uh, you know, it's, the, it's whatever it is, it's stupid. You know, it's the economy is stupid. Well, you can say it's the details stupid. Donors also have to stop fat mongering. You know, uh, Sudhendra Sharma has got this chapter in this book where in 60 cases he shows that, you know, donor fads from import led to export, uh, led to import substituted to basic needs to, you know, we have had these fads change almost every five to ten years, okay? And that confuses the whole system and we never really get to doing development. And finally, we need to democratize and development planning with all voices, but then it's not enough just to get the voices to be heard. And this is Consum Theory's most important message. Mm -hmm. It's not only enough to be heard, you must also be responded to. So every voice, the three-legged voices must be heard and the other two must respond to that voice. When that happens, we have constructive engagement, not destructive impasse, and probably much better development than otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, Nipalji. Uh, as I said, he's a pundit. You know, you could listen to him like a Quran for seven days uh, without stopping uh, anything. So I think uh, I don't need to summarize. Uh, he was with the slides and examples. He was quite clear. Uh, and now, whatever time has been left, I would like to devote that time to some you know, concerns, questions, and, and queries. Uh, please, uh, we'll do that. A couple of questions first, and then ask Deepak to respond. Uh, Sometimes uh, Deepak can go on and on. I have to stop him. Uh, but please, uh, please identify yourself. Uh, there must be volunteers with the mic. Uh, please identify yourself and be direct, polite, straight, whatever. Uh, so, uh, please. Uh, last row. Uh, uh, the, 
some of the, some of the best egalitarians have been anarchists, you know, and even Gandhi is seen as an anarchist in a way. Okay, in fact, they put him in jail. Uh, this other guy, guy who in Jharkhand, this barefoot doctor who was arrested the other day uh, by Indian government, he's a doctor, barefoot. He was going around and he was arrested for being a Maoist sympathizer. And his statement was classic. He said that I am so glad to be arrested under that 1924 or whatever 1824 Act, Indian Penal Code Act, under which Mahatma Gandhi was also arrested. He said. You know? yeah. So, so we see uh, uh, we we don't like that uh, label. Now, as far as faithless are concerned, the reason faithless uh, are taken out of the policy triangle. Although there is recent work by Marco Velve in Bremen, which shows that fatalists are not really as fatalist as made out to be because they react. So consumer reaction, voter reaction, well in the US and in Brexit, it's a voter reaction. These are fatalists who, right or wrong, I may not like it, but have reacted because the so-called economic growth passed them by. The 1% benefited more and 99% got more and more fatalized. Okay? So, they do react. So there are a few places where faithless can react, and faithless react when goaded, especially by uh, some kind of activism, uh, either of the market, of the egalitarians, or even of the uh, of hierarchism. So uh, if faithless organized, they would no longer be faithless. They would be on one of the other three. Okay. So this is where we see anarchism and fatalism kind of reaction. Uh, Ajiti, of the six uh, action plans, where are we lagging? I think uh, our problem, the more I reflect on this, this is a question that there's no, there's no easy answer, but the more I reflect on this, the more I see that our society seems to be so hierarchy prone uh, in its state kind of thinking, but then effectively it's a very, very uh, egalitarian society. So I have I've come to using the word after that uh, 2015 earthquake, you know, our hierarchic state, everybody expects the government to do it, they form this whatever rehabilitation, whatever uh, commission and all. Uh, what they produce more is six or five CEOs, you know, in, in three years, okay? Uh, whereas nothing much has happened. Whereas you go to pattern, you go to all these places, and these temples, houses, people have got together and restored it. I was stunned to see in Charikot that the whole place has already come up because they are all Saudis, they are insured their houses, and it's now the banks there. Uh, that have, uh, they've got money for the banks to restore it. So you see market coming, you know, the unfortunate thing is that Nepal is getting uh, indebted. There is a much bigger indebtedness danger now in Nepal. But still, that acted when the government did not act. Okay? So I think our problem when we are lacking is we tend to uh, hive off problems straight off to the government when we should not be doing that. I think what is really needed is a much, much more critical attitude to government which is something that over the last 10 years, I think, has declined significantly. 1990s was the golden period of uh, environmental and social activism in Nepal. Uh, whereas this century's first, whatever, 15 years has been a disaster. Now, how to get responded? Yeah, that's a very good question. We distinguish uh, between constructive engagement of these social solidarities uh, versus non-constructive, okay? Now, non-constructive, uh, let me begin with that. Uh, non-constructive engagement is when uh, there is a hegemony and they're not, not only not responding, they're not even listening. Okay. The result is this will lead to a kind of a tragedy. Uh, the Maoist insurgency is the best example of that that comes to mind. Okay. I had uh, Mr. Deoba responded to that 40-point program put forth by Bhavra Bhattray it would have undercut his moral legitimacy to go to the jungle. If Vishwanath Upadhyay had not given that disastrous judgment in the Supreme Court, you know, where all that, after Bhavaram split off from that, you know, this moto Shaw Masala and Bhattaro Masala, whatever, you know, the communists, you never know, you know, it's just unbelievable, it's very difficult to even track them. But when they split, all he was asking was the right to be recognized as a uh, party. Where, under the pressure or uh, whatever of big parties, Vishwanath Upadhyay took a decision that did not recognize that. So suddenly a group that was already within the parliamentary system inside the parliament found the legitimacy to go to the jungle and reject the entire parliamentary system. 
you see. So when you have a hegemony that does not listen, you know, things can get disastrously wrong like that. Now, responded, uh, the example often given as Scandinavian democracies and others, where all these voices are at the table and they are responded to. we give you an example with ozone treaty, or uh, to take a case in Nepal itself, uh, uh, the World Commission on Dams. Now, Nepal is the only country which actually took the World Commission on Dams report, you know, and began a process of constructive engagement with it. That is, India rejected, China, all kinds of governments <coughs> rejected the report. And initially, the Nepali bureaucracy also rejected it. Say, oh, if you follow the World Commission on Dams, no, no, uh, no dams will be built. The World Commission on Dams, for heaven's sake, never said, don't build dams. What they said was, if you follow these guidelines, you will probably build a better dam. So, you know, same as what I said, it's not no dams that we say here, we say no bad dams. Okay? So, World Commission on Dams, we decided at that point that no, we should engage with the World Commission on Dams report. So, a committee was formed that had uh, the, the dam uh, ministry people, the dam managers. We had the dam builders from the private sector. And we had the dam critics from the environmental movement, okay? And uh, we put them together, and as Steve Rayner, my good friend in Oxford, he put it, you had the whole dam lot, okay? <laughs> and they engaged, they were supposed to engage for four months, they actually engaged for 14 months and produced some pretty outstanding report. The conclusion of that was, Nepali laws, thanks to this activism of the 1990s, was already in consonance to 48%, okay? Uh, of the World Commission on Dams. An example, World Commission on Dams says local people should benefit. Nepali laws already had 50% of Nepal government's revenue going to local bodies. Okay? Nowhere else in the world. And there are many examples. And there were another something like, I don't know, 40 or so percent that within five years we could easily have achieved. So this was an example of actually constructive engagement where voices were heard. But this requires a sort of a democracy, a real pluralistic democracy at work. <coughs> I think, uh, <coughs> yeah, anybody would like to join the discussions? Please. Yeah. We'll take three questions, answer, and then hopefully then. Namaste, my name is Ruchita Sharma Bichit. I'm a development worker and I've been working with different aid organizations as well as. NGOs for the last 10 to 15 years and I've come to a realization like Deepak sir has that does aid really work as that's the global debate also and I have a gut feeling also because I've been evaluating programs in the field that our development is not as good as it should be. So if we are if we are to remove all the aid organizations and foreign aid and NGOs, what model of development do you think would be a good development model for Nepal and countries likewise? What motto do you think should we embrace so that we have a good development? This is um, this is the first um, social science Baba lecture I have attended, and I'm beginning to realize how much I miss. Such an excellent presentation, <coughs> and congratulations for it. There's so much get to it. But um, I want to go back to your first slide, I suppose, where you were recounting your move from an engineer to um, a cultural theorist, a political economist, whatever. I'm an engineer, and you started by saying engineering was more of a problem than a solution. I still believe to this day that engineering can be a solution. I think the problem is engineering but engineering without cultural sensitivity, without social responsibility, is a problem. Not engineering itself. <laughs> the first time you saw it, that is engineering. That is creative engineering. It's not the engineering you learn in Oxford, but it's your engineering. And also, you know, in a country which aspires to mass to, you know, we have our model of development the same as it is in the United Kingdom, the United States, or whatever we want the roads, we want services, we want electricity, we want all of that. So, brush can would work somewhere, and high dams perhaps would be required somewhere else. So we cannot just ignore engineering. Um, that's A. 
And B is, I think a question was asked earlier about how do we bring, you know, this, this is, the, our whole problem is this compartmentalization of different cultural, um, I don't know how to call it, perspectives, let's say. And them not talking to each other. I think that the need of the time is to bridge these different cultural groups for a positive outcome. Uh, your comments. I think, uh, yes, okay. Okay, okay, okay. One, um, actually I think uh, aid should not be banned. On the contrary, we need it, but it should be harnessed properly. That's the whole point. Uh, as one of, the, one of the people who fought against the World Bank on many issues, including Arun III, uh, today I sit back and think, Good Lord, World Bank was the easy target, damn it, because they had values, they were accountable to the American uh, Senate and the British House of Lords and Japanese Diet and all that. So you could, we actually went to the US uh, Senate to argue with the senators there, the US under Secretary for uh, Treasury, we did that. And they put pressure on the bank, you know. I shudder to think right now, how are we going to handle the Chinese banks? There is no equivalent mechanism as an activist that I can think of, okay. Now, what do we do with Gejua and Budigandaki? It's a disaster. But where do we start? I can't go to the Chinese uh, People's Congress and you know, speak there, but I can do that in the United States uh, Senate. Okay. So, the, the, the need right now is uh, uh, to actually begin a process of activism that reflects on aid, exposes its good and bad sides, and I think we need more of that. It's not happening. And the fault to my mind lies with the uh, NGO movement, which was very active in the 90s, but has completely lost its way now, I think. You know? uh, not only in the South, in the North too. In fact, I wrote an article in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists comes out of Chicago, this is Doomsday Clock people. And the title of my piece was called, Why I Think Trump is Going to Be Good for Climate Change. And the bottom line, it shocked a lot of people, that article. But uh, the reason I think Trump is going to be good for climate change is he's forcing northern NGOs to go back to activism. Otherwise, northern NGOs were all just spending 99% of their time raising funds for you know, running their organizations and doing procedural stuff. So this is why I think that uh, that kind of uh, uh, solution is there. Uh, not to get rid of aid, uh, because aid has, as we argue in this book, done some good work. So let's not throw the baby out of the bathwater. On, um, Engineering, thanks. I'm also an engineer, and you put hope back in engineering. So, Narishi, thanks. But the point here is, uh, and you put that at the, at the end, this compartmentalization. We have, I mean, I'll give you an example of irrigation in Nepal. Okay? Irrigation department, I have written about it in Water Auditors. You can Google and get my article there on something called the Voices of Water Professionals. It's a special issue. I saw most online downloaded journal comes out of somewhere in France, I believe, but it's in English, okay? And uh, uh, what I argued there as my experience as minister that led that department or ministry or whatever you call it, water, I argued and it upset a lot of my irrigation engineer friends. Uh, I said irrigation engineers in Nepal and Bihar, which I know very well, uh, have nothing to do with water or farmers. Engineering, uh, irrigation engineering is all about cement contracts, okay? And I can give you hundreds of examples where in a district, the district irrigation engineer has never talked, never discussed professionally with the JTA. This is the agriculture officer there. They may be living in the same official compound. You know, their wives might be, you know, sharing recipes, okay? But they have never really talked. Find me one where an irrigation engineer is talking to an agriculture JTA. It's not happening. So this compartmentalization and irrigation, you know, the civil engineers don't talk to the electrical ones, and that's another side. So that uh, the book of ours, which is coming out in March from Routledge, um, and you live in Canada, so you can buy it, it'll probably be priced at eighty dollars. No, nobody here will buy it. Okay, it's not on the nexus and the politics of nexus, uh, justice and uh, equ equity and politics is what we argue in that book. Okay, now this is where engineering education has to really be restructured. You know, we are not training proper engineers, we are training bad businessmen, you know, who are only interested in contracts. 
So this is where the problem lies. Uh, thank you very much, Deepakji, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, we can go on forever and ever uh, with Deepakji. Deepakji is a fantastic uh, researcher, insightful person with a lot of experience, and uh, we have our own sessions uh, wherever we may meet. So it's been getting late. Uh, thank you very much for your um, indulgence. Uh, and do, we, do come to a, another session, the lecture, which will be 101. Uh, so we, the bar lectures are open to the public, free, uh, sir, free sitting. Uh, basically, there are no seat reserves for anyone. Uh, it's a basically the idea of coming together and conversation. Thank you very much for a wonderful conversation. With you. And with a token of appreciation, uh, we give the mark of social science bar uh, with his name inscribed here. Oh, wow. And your lectures may also. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs>